Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Hi everyone and welcome to On The House, the Household Management Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with expert knowledge from professionals in the field. I'm your host, Gabriella Yastra, coming to you from NAM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's get started. Hi everyone and welcome back to the show. Today we're going to be talking about the environmental footprint from the perspective of life cycle thinking. Today we're going to be joined by Melissa Diaz, who is a circular economy specialist and environmental engineer. Hi, welcome to the show. Hi Gabriela. Thank you. Um, th thank you for coming and joining me today. Um, first of all, we'd like to get to know you and your background and what brought you here. So do you mind introducing yourself a little bit? Sure. Well, um, I am from Costa Rica. I'm an environmental engineer. Um, I've been working for the industry, consultancy industry for over 10 years now. I did my master's degree in the UK and then came back and worked in a couple of countries like Mexico and the US. Uh, basically in life cycle and life cycle assessment, which is one methodology to address life cycle thinking. So, so yes. And then um, later I built my own consultancy project that is called the Footprint Initiative, where we try to uh, get awareness of what is our environmental, social, and economic footprint to the world. <laughs> that sounds so interesting. I can't wait to learn more about life cycle thinking and the circular economy. Um, but before we do that, uh, we're going to have a section called Have You Met Melissa, where we get to know a few um, different things about you. So our first question is, uh, what is your favorite book? Well, uh, that's hard, but um, my favorite, favorite book of all times is uh, Little Prince by Antoine de saint Super. That's a child book, but I always enjoy it and it brings me different insights every time I read it. So I love it. Yeah. I've read that book as well. And what I like about it is that it's for kids, but it's not really just for kids. It's also for the adults reading it. Exactly. Exactly. It has a lot of metaphors and it actually depends on the time you read it. You can find a different reflection of what you're reading just uh, in different times of the year or something or moods. I don't know. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's a great book. Um, and um, have there been any movies you've watched recently? Yes, yes, I like and I like to go to the movies a lot. Um, and one I particularly loved was uh, Avatar, which uh, that that one is like uh, it covers a lot about and it's a criticism about the environment, the way we are uh, acting as humans, right? And uh, this uh, second second movie of Avatar was really, really nice because it covers water, water environment, which I love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. A lot of people have said they've really enjoyed that movie recently. Um, so I'm glad to hear that you've got a slightly different perspective. Everyone's like, wow, the, the cinematography is amazing. And you're like, oh, I love the meaning. <laughs> I love the meaning. I, I always love the meaning. So it's such a, a strong criticism of humankind versus uh, another culture that is actually trying to care and communicating, having a strong bond with nature and animals and stuff. So it's, it's, it's always, I always keep reflecting. I think I, I saw Avatar when I was like a teenager. I don't know, it was so long ago. I think uh, that spoke to me in my heart and that was part of uh, reasons why I took uh, this environment journey. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's really great to hear um, that, you know, it inspired you and now here you are, I guess, I don't know how many years later that the movie, the second movie has finally come out, but yeah. Like 20, and here you are. I don't know, it was too long. <laughs> it was a long time ago, I mean, like 10 years or something. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, exactly. 
Mm. And do you listen to any podcasts? Yeah, um, I often listen more to self-improvement or, I don't know, positivism podcasts or so. Um, right now I'm, I'm listening to a book uh, that is call, called The Power of Positive Thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that about? It's about changing your mindset. It's about uh, trying to uh, to be more uh, aware of your thoughts and knowing that you can control them in order to change your life. So those kinds of things I really enjoy. Maybe sometimes while I'm working, I'm also listening at the same time, something like that. Yeah. Wow. I don't think I could listen to a podcast and also work at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I do it, but I do it. <laughs> mm. Um, do you have a role model? Mm, yeah, well, I can say my role model is actually my mom. Yeah, I always my mm -hmm. <laughs> just uh, her character and the way the way she handles the stuff. It's really something I I like to become someday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that. Um... Moms, moms are so inspiring because, you know, they, they're always there for you, or I hope they are. The good ones are, I suppose. Then, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. No. Particularly my mom, she, she knows a way of handle like, difficult situations. And I'm like, I'm really, I'm really inspired the way she uh, comes over every time from difficult stuff. Right? So that's something I've been in it for to be. Mm. And I love that. I love being able to like ask my mom for help. Um, yes. So I, I guess your mom, she'd be great at helping you with difficult situations. Yes, I always come to her for advice. Of course, she's very wise. <laughs> mm. um, and has there been a course that's inspired you? Well, uh, like, a, like a course, I believe my master courses when I try to specialize in it. Those I I was really expecting to get a lot of insights from them, and I find I had I was lucky to find two doors that pushed me a little bit into more critical thinking of the courses. So they 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 were talking about new concepts like circular economy, environmental economics, and so so kind of questioning the way we are the way the production system is working, the way the economy is working and how can we improve it. So I really enjoy my master's courses. And yeah, I can see that they've definitely inspired you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They didn't disappoint me at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how would you define household management? Well, for me, household management is... Um, like a series of activities that has to be done in order to run and maintain a house, right? So it involves a lot of uh, roles of the people there in the house, many tasks or decisions that have to be made and all sorts of activities that need to be um, in order to for the, for the house to run. Mm. And... Um... What is a what is an environmental footprint? Oh well, uh, an environmental footprint. Um, I like to compare that to to our social food, footprint. You know, um, like um, when you when you meet someone or anytime you interact with someone, you leave a mark. You leave a um, so you leave something uh, by interacting with other people, right? So same thing happens with the environment. Uh, we we need the environment, we need resources. And at the same time, we are leaving a mark. We are leaving a, a footprint in there. Uh, the way we consume, the way we use the resources, that is our own responsibility. So environmental footprint, um, it's good to measure it, to understand what we are doing, to be responsible and to lower it for the sake of of the humanity, but for the sake of the planet itself, right? So that is the, the footprint that, uh, in terms of environment, that we have to care about. And I imagine that 
our household and how and what we do in our house that really has a big effect on our environmental footprint. How so? Yes, because um, like as consumers, we are taking decisions every day. So I like to call it like the the power of our purchases. Like every time we go to a supermarket or we go to a shop, we are um, deciding to support someone who build that product, who will put that product there for you to to use it. So you have the the power to to support uh, best choices uh, in this case. And now that there's internet, and now that we have a lot of information, there is a, there is no excuses to say, no, I didn't know that this company was uh, doing bad things or or not, because uh, we always have a choice, right? So it's it's our turn uh, by, by buying stuff. We are encouraging different types of, of production and encouraging different lifestyles. So in the households, we take a lot of decisions, right? Um, about what we need for the house, about the way we want to uh, run it. So so at the end of the day, it's part of, it's part of the consumerism that we, we need to, to, to attack. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you're saying that um, between picking, like, I guess, two types of bread, two different um, producers, um, that choice can influence um, the environment. So I guess how, and you mentioned the internet is a way, is, is somewhere that we can find this information, but the internet's a big place. How yes. can we start, um, I guess, how can going start? about making those decisions? Yes. Um, the thing is like, it, not only internet, but there is also in our times, there is, a, there are apps out there. Uh, that are making it easier for us to search for information, to um, access quickly to to a, a product and see scores even of how good or bad are they doing. Uh, you can download it to your phone and just with a barcode, it tells you if you have a question in, on the supermarket about a, a product or the label that they are claiming, you just use your barcode and and apps like Good Guide. There are tons of apps already. Uh, they gave you they give you extra information about that problem that for you to make a decision. So uh, that's why I say there's no excuse if you really want to inform yourself and try to support uh, 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 like a different type of production or companies that are trying to do better then the information is out there. So you just need to maybe take a little bit extra time to to see uh, and to be aware of that. So what kind of information um, do we need to be looking at in the apps? Because um, I imagine there are, there'd be a lot of different types of information um, that we're given and having to weigh up the sort of costs and benefits. Yes, well, um, Apps are very different and all the apps have different information right now. Um, some of them give scores about the um, environmental, social, uh, and responsible, responsible practices that corporations are giving. This is called corporate social responsibility. So they give a certain score or they give certain information uh, about what the company is claiming, maybe in their web page, maybe through some communication to their media uh, channels or so. Um, so they are trying to gather in, in one app uh, that information for all. And I think it's it's just a, 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 a perfect opportunity for us to develop a little, a little bit of critical thinking into the information that the apps are, are giving. And of course, there's always room for improvement in there. Yeah, because I think there are a lot of uh, apps with a lot of information out there. Um, we don't have the perfect one yet to say, oh, this is the one that is gonna guide me. Uh, where I take the best decisions when I buy stuff, but uh, still uh, they are uh, really good tools, at least for, for us to have a little bit um, 
an overall view of the company's good practices. <laughs> mm. So something I've noticed, um, I've used one myself. Um, I'll go on the company's website and they'll say, well, we're really eco-friendly. We do all these things. And then I go and look at their rating and it's not very good. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, because there are different ways of measuring their, their how good they are doing, right? Uh, so for instance, um, the methodology that I I use more in is the consultancy perspective. Uh, it's called life cycle assessment, and what we're trying to do is to uh, to see the whole life cycle of every product. Like every product has um, a first step when their uh, material that are being acquired, right? Uh, raw material that are being extracted from nature. Then there is a step where is the production when we transform all of those materials. Then we use them a certain period of time and there is an, an end of life. And that in the use, an end of life, us as consumer, we have most of the responsibility over there, right? Um, but there is the whole life cycle. So companies um, uh, are trying to understand that. Uh, so they, they they build this methodology, the life cycle assessment, to understand and give them some numbers already to quantify the impact in every step of the of the process. But as consumers, then we do have some uh, part of the uh, a share of the environmental impact in the use phase and in the end of life, right? So in those phases, that that is that depends on how we how we decide to use the product, or how we decide to dispose it, or maybe uh, reuse it, rearrange it, repurpose it for something, um, or not. So I guess um, as consumers, we should be looking at the initial um, producing stages and picking something that has a lower environment, environmental footprint. And then I guess the way where we actually act is um, how we use the product and how we, um, the end of life of the product. Is that correct? Yeah, we can always, um, the, the, I always say that this power of fortune that we have as consumers uh, give us like the the advantage that we can always make questions and make pressure on the industry, right? Um, this has been this has been such a big deal for companies. Uh, they are really trying to take care of their reputation. They are uh, trying to under listening already the customers, but because at the end of the day, we are the ones that uh, they have they live because of us. Their products are all uh, being out there are out there for 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 someone that needs them right? so they are they are really trying channels are are being open a little bit i think more for us to make ra the right questions about how the products are being produced uh, make the right questions uh, for them and then uh, even even to ask them how is the proper way to 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 use a product and dispose it at the end of life because their responsibility their responsibility doesn't end when they sell the product. They are responsible of the product until they their end of life. So they should guide us as consumers through the whole to the rest of the product life stages. Mm -hmm. And so what methods um you know can they use to guide us um for the end of stages? Well, um, normally they, well, <laughs> this is something that I, I always say, people don't read the instructions, right? Because they all, they, sometimes they try to give us like a, a first approach by, by a pamphlet, by the instructions. But um, they always, they are always uh, um, updating their channels through media, through the websites already. In case you don't you don't read the instructions that or you don't you don't reach them. So um, and then our, I have seen they have live chats in case you have uh, doubts or something by yourself and you want to contact. So that that's that's what I mean when I said that the channel is the channels are opening. Uh, so you can ask them if, uh, for example, you don't you are not sure how to how to dispose of a product uh, 
at the end of the life. And you might think it's it's easier to just uh, put it in the landfill, but it, it, there might be a better way. They uh, they are already making recommendations and giving in their websites all the fact um, questions and so uh, trying to reach the customers and incentivize uh, better ways of disposing their products. Mm -hmm. But I guess, so, you know, I have a product that was made in one country and they've shipped it over to where I am. And uh -huh. they might say on there recyclable, but I believe that different councils and different governments, different places have different recycling requirements. So just because something yes. is recyclable in one place doesn't mean it's recyclable where I am. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Totally correct. And that's uh, such a um, challenge that we are facing nowadays. Um, and then the, the other thing is like, uh, we saw recycling as society as, as the number one solution of our our pollution uh, problems, right? And that that has proven not to be the case because recycling, yeah, the most successful countries that the ones that have the higher rates of recycling are just about 30%. This means that only 30% of everything that could be recycling, recycled is re actually recycled in that country. And that's very low. So the thing is like, we can recycle our way out of waste, right? Uh, we have to think about different uh, perspectives. This is where circular economy uh, comes into place, that it's trying to, uh, um, that is incentivizing just a way to to reduce your waste. And so, so and give it a second life, try to repair, try to maintain, um, just not uh, not use uh, waste and landfills as the primary uh, end of life of products, right? So, so yeah, that's something that we have to 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 care about because recycling is, is recycling is, hasn't been the best alternative that we have, and landfills are already collapsing in every side of the world, and then and then again uh, there there and there. Are, Lower economies, and uh, they don't have enough possibilities of uh, recycling. They have maybe uh, some sort of types of plastics that they can recycle, and not all of the plastic, not all of the metal, and everything gets exported to somewhere. Yeah. Mm. So you're saying that um, recycling is good but it's not it's not the um main solution that you're suggesting and you're saying yeah. that the be a better solution is to like reuse and reduce our waste correct mm -hmm. there yes i like to say uh, to my students that the best waste is the one that we don't produce <laughs> mm -hmm. so basically if you don't generate waste if you re um, reject uh waste uh Precisely what happened? What happened in the in the grocery stores that they are not uh, giving bags uh, for two reasons: uh, for political reasons that they are already banning plastic bags, right? But also because people are rejecting them, so they they are just not offering bags anymore. And we should do we should think like that for every item that we are acquiring. Like uh, then our number one question should be. When we try to purchase something, do I really need? That should be our number one question, and before before anything else. And if we really need that, well, yes, then go for it. But try to to look at the life cycle of it. Try to ask yourself: Do I really know about this product? Am I supporting a real consciousness industry that is developing this product or not? Those should be in like our 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 questions when acquiring something. I sort of went through this a little while ago. I got back into uh, I decided to start running, and I was like, I need to buy some running clothes for this. So I did all this research, to try and find the most environmentally friendly gym clothes so I could run and still be good for the environment. And then I realized I should just look at my wardrobe first. 
and I found enough clothes um, <laughs> that I'd yes. already had and I didn't have to buy anything. And so I got to reuse all of that clothes. And then luckily I have friends and family where I live. They gave me things and now I have too much. Little mistake. You didn't need to buy anything extra. Yes. Yes, because um, most of the times it happens. We think, or maybe because a change of season and then our culture is based on consumerism. That thing we have uh, every day, we are bombarded by this, like uh, media, in the TV, wherever, right? But uh, we start, we, we need to start. Uh, thinking for a second, if we really mean well, we are our uh, buying, or it's just like we are going with the flow, right? Uh, because that that's not sustainable. That's not good for the environment. And at the end of the day, we don't need it. So it it's gonna be. It's starting to ask ourselves those questions. Is gonna be good for our for our pocket even. So so this is just starting to think uh, the good questions. <laughs> But so you mentioned before with the plastic bags um, and we're not using them anymore, but I did see somewhere that the canvas bags that we're using now are actually worse for the environment than the plastic bags. Is that correct? There is our controversy in there. <laughs> and we can talk about plastic and the rest of the, the hours. Um, because um, you, you, you see plastic, if we think about the life cycle of plastic, and mm -hmm. the manufacturing process of plastic is really efficient. When you, when, when I can do a life cycle assessment and it's, it's going to give me better, sorry, less impact for plastic than for, for a craft bag. So, because just they, the plastic industry has become very efficient nowadays. Um, and it's even cheaper than the craft bag. Um, but the thing is like, that's only the production stage. Um, then is the use stage. Um, uh, most of the plastics are, uh, used like, uh, what, 20 minutes and then they are thrown away. And when they are thrown away and we just have so lower, um, percentage of recycling in our countries, most of the plastic is being driven, going to the seas, going to rivers, right? And the thing is like in the end of life, they're staying almost 500 years in the environment. If we think about that, it means that all of the plastic that has ever been produced is all, it's still here because it has not been decomposed. It takes 500 years to decompose of the plastic. Um, instead of a crab bag, when where crab, crab bags, um, the, uh, at most they last for 20 years. And that's a lot. Could last like, like uh, five years, five to twenty. Mm -hmm. So, so when you think about the life cycle of plastic, the life cycle of uh, paper bags, it it will just depend on what is the production of it and the end of life of it. Uh, that's why some people say, "Oh, it's plastics are are greener," but they are just focusing on manufacturing and not in the end of life. And some of them might, might go for craft because they are looking at the end of life and how they So it's a tricky question over there. I don't think we have the perfect solutions for, 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 for the necessity that, that the box need. The only solution I can give, and I always tell my students, is just to try to reuse anything as much as you can. If you have a, a bag that you can reuse for over 12, uh, to 50 times, that is gonna cover for for the the environmental impacts of producing that that bag in the first place. So the best thing, so the best waste is the one we don't produce. It all goes over trying to reduce as much as. So yeah, that's um, yeah. That obviously, the most important thing is that you know whatever we have. Um, we reuse. So whether that is a plastic bag that we happen to have, we reuse that as much as possible and then I guess dispose of it um, in a um, environmentally friendly way rather than just putting into landfill, seeing if we can recycle that. Um, so I guess that means that one of my questions was, 
if we have something that's unenvironmentally friendly, we shouldn't just throw it away. We should keep using it. Is that correct? Yes, we we should try to reuse as much as we can. That's mm -hmm. the main goal. Um, it doesn't mean that, well, for plastic bags, for instance, we can reuse them as much as, as we can, and we are we are going to save a lot to the environment of the production of a new bag for the new for, for the same purpose. So so yeah, the main goal will be that to just reuse it and try to be aware of what you have because most mm -hmm. of the things we already have them. Um, try to um, repurpose when you with with uh, a public comes to to its end of life. We can also uh, think about ways to not dispose it like uh, right away, right? Um, or to uh, repair them some sort of way. So that's uh, the power that we have also in there. It's just to extend the life of products just by trying to repair instead of trying to buy the same thing uh, over and over. So another one that I was thinking of was if you have like a really old car that is very not fuel efficient, um, but would it be worse to keep using it and keep producing a lot of fumes or is it better for the environment to purchase a new car um, and have one that is, you know, more fuel efficient, more environmentally friendly? Because you're still producing something in the end, which is a, a new car. Yes. Um well, you can always repair the car, right? <laughs> you can always try to see what is going on because most of the times that when there is a, a problem and there is a, a fuel emission result, it, it comes back as, as problems in maintaining. So, so we should try to address the issue uh, first instead of uh, like uh, thinking of buying a new one right away because that will involve other parts of the car uh, that have to be brand new. Right. So it, it is always best to try to repair what we have than to just create a whole thing from new. Rachel. Okay, interesting. So what are some other ways that we can introduce uh, life cycle thinking into our homes? Well, um, we can also think about the life cycle of our, our homes themselves, you know, uh, the house has a life cycle. So many people are not aware of that, uh, but to, to build a house, we need materials. We need, uh, all sorts of, uh, construction products, right? Uh, then there is a use feature. Most of the time it's 60 years or so. Uh, and then there's a the construction process. So think about if we can make our houses more, with more sustainable materials or replace uh, with more sustainable materials that we have. Then at the end of the life cycle of the house, we, we could uh, make less impact that from traditional materials. That's one thing in our physical spaces. But then also as consumers, anything we buy, anything there, um, it's a result from our decisions, right? So we, anything you see in your house has a life cycle. So you can start just asking yourself those questions and I hope it's not that exhausting, but uh, there is always a time to reflect about if we want to be more sustainable, about what we are supporting out there, what we are acquiring at the end. I guess for anyone who is feeling overwhelmed with this, the idea of questioning everything we purchase, because we purchase a lot of things, um, what, I guess, what is an easy first step for everyone to take? Well, I will say um, you could also, you could always go take a little bit more time in the, in the grocery store and just try to read the label. Try to read what, uh, because uh, environmental labeling, it's made for you to to communicate right away in a quick, easy way with with uh, the product. The product has tried to tell you something, right? 
So he, many people don't pay attention to labels, but they give us some sort of information. Um, and then with that uh, information, we can also go back to the internet and 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 see and 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 we really inform ourselves about what they are trying to declare. Um, we have to be a little bit careful because there is many information out there. There's a term uh, I'm sure you've heard is called brainwashing, where they are trying to give a, a green cover of something that is might, need, might not be so green, right? <laughs> so um, that's part of our critical thinking too. But um, for anyone who wants to take a first step, I would recommend just to to read the labels of the products that we are purchasing. But that seems to take, it would take a lot more time, wouldn't it, to if you wanted to read yes. the labels of everything you wanted to buy? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's the, I think that's the, one of the challenges that we have. And what I've seen um, uh, by the consulting work that I do, uh, there is a lot of investigation of how to make it easier for the customer to take decisions like right away and um, maybe by some something already in display when you when you are acquired from the grocery store or some a sort of information that it can be right at your face and you don't have to read a lot or uh, go to a web page or go to a um, to a link or something uh, so there is a lot of investigation in that sense because well, honestly, um, as consumers, we don't we don't like to think so much of the time. Uh, we don't like to be that bother um, unless there is some concern or unless you say, yeah, I'm consciously not gonna support um, animal mistreatment. I don't know in cosmetics, for example. So so uh, I think that's part of our responsibility, but also the producers have the responsibility of trying to make it easier something that they are um, still working out yes because um i'm glad to hear that um i guess we're trying to make inroads into actually making it easier um and take less take less time because i i feel like that's a big barrier no um, for everyone um is there anything that I've missed that you wanted to talk about? Well, no, I think it's way okay. too a lot. <laughs> Great. But I might um, like to, to talk a little bit about circular economy in case uh, someone has not heard about it. Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, that That's a tendency, I guess, from the industry to try to be another um, effort to try to be green and you see but the thing is like uh, it's inspiring nature basically um, if you look at nature I don't see really uh, I guess I'm encouraging anyone to think if they see an example in nature that uh, something that it's uh, something that it's really waste something that is not being used and um, in, in another process because in nature basically we have no waste um, it's so efficient that we can we, we cannot uh, it's not it's not easy to have a an example of waste um, mm. so that's basically circular economy trying to so, emulate uh, nature in that sense so uh, one animal's waste is another um, plant's fertilizer exactly exactly and even rocks are um, part of the, I don't know, the nitrogen cycle or anything. There, there is nothing, there is no, mineral, no, no emission mineral or whatever organic thing that is not being used in another process. Um, everything has a value. So that's circular economy, trying to give value to everything, design our way out of waste. Sure. So, what's an example? How can we implement circular economy into our lives? Oh well, um, I think just by reducing our waste. You know, uh, for example, composting. What we do in, what most of us start to do in our homes right now, uh, trying to create compost. 
it's a way of uh, giving value to organic material that otherwise will go to landfills and will be just creating more CO2 emissions, more global warming. But still, we are instead we are creating organic uh, material uh, for planting for gardens and so that's a perfect way of circularity. Uh, exactly what nature does. Right? Nature doesn't have uh, things that in a whole space doing nothing and creating <laughs> creating uh, emissions. And uh, so that is a perfect example. But um, the thing is, like producers and uh, more in a company level, they are already trying to design things. Um, the way the circular economy could work. So try to design things for for reassembling, for example, um, your telephone, your your cell phone. That if something um, it needs repairing, it could be easily done. Or the computer, for example. Uh, so so many uh, there are many efforts trying to emulate nature in that sense right now. That's great. And I'm I'm glad to see that it's not all up to the consumer. It's also the producers who are taking responsibility there as well. Cause um it can I can it feels a bit overwhelming, I think, as a consumer sometimes, um, <laughs> to try and think of every aspect of your life. Um is there is there a practice that you do in your own home that you use to manage your environmental footprint? Well, um, I do try to reduce an up. <laughs> I uh -huh. always uh, ask myself that question if I need something uh, before before buying it, right? The other thing I do, and I don't like it that much, is I recycle a lot. Uh, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm making, even by the practice of recycle, then you are being aware of the packaging. And next time you go to the grocery store, you are thinking, oh, I can recycle this, this is not recycled, and then I take the decisions over there. So if it could be overwhelming at first if you are just starting this journey, but at the end of the day, it just becomes an habit of being aware of this critical thinking of what, a, what am I, uh, am I part of the problem or part of the solution, basically. <laughs> so that's the sort of things that I, I do it like uh, every day. <laughs> And I guess once you know what you're looking for and once you know what your area, how your area, area recycles, then you know what to look for. It's not a chore anymore. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, yeah, and there are many, I think there's, uh, local governments are trying to give that information to, to, to the people, right? Uh, how to recycle, what is recycled, where is recycled. Because there are some sort of stuff that you have to, if you want to recycle properly, you have to take it out of the waste stream and yeah. take it yourself to a facility. Right? That is a challenge, and I don't think that's very successful right now. But that that's what we have, and at least they are trying to make make aware of how to properly dispose of stuff. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we've got some questions from the audience now. Um, so our first question is quite a long one, so I'll just read it out for you. <laughs> okay. So composite materials reduce the weight of a car um, and they reduce uh, fuel consumption. But um, the disadvantage of composite materials is that you have to recycle them and it can be hard to do that. I guess, how do you weigh those two factors? It's true, composite materials are hard to recycle because they are not 100% pure materials and that is a challenge. Um, I guess the the best thing is not to use composite materials in the first place because you have to design in order, I mean, the producer has to think uh, if you want to be build a, a more Circular, circularity product, you have to think about the best way to to dissemble and to re, to recover all those um, flows and all those inputs that you are putting in. So I don't believe composite materials are the best solution because 
um, they are not easily, um, you cannot easily disintegrate them at this time and it will consume more energy uh, and more resources just to try to decouple them. So, so yeah, the, uh, in, in terms of of the design, then the producer has to, to think of other sort of ways of uh, make it easier for it to, to at the end of the life. Okay. So I guess the reducing the fuel consumption, so reducing how much pollution it creates when it's being driven around doesn't um, take away from the whole um, yeah, life cycle of the product. It, I, think, I think that's not an issue of composite materials and, um, because um, when you reduce fuel consumption, well, it could be because the car weight is, is, is less than a typical mm-hmm. car, right? Uh, but then, then again, uh, there are some other materials that doesn't need to be composite materials uh, that are lightweight, like plastics, for example. So if you could, if you could uh, build a car, I don't know, with all the, we're not talking here about uh, security, right? with all the security standards and so, and you can easily disassemble it and easily separate the materials that will be best for the planet than composite material. I think there are uh, different solutions out of it, mm-hmm. other than just use composite materials. Okay. Roughly. And our second question from the um, audience is, who uses life cycle thinking? Because it seems like a very um, <laughs> lofty goals, I guess. Well, um, I think we should all use life cycle thinking. <laughs> we, we, as consumers, like I said, we should start to make ourselves our own questions. But um, producers use life cycle thinking, life cycle assessment, which is the methodology uh, to quantify all of these sort of these environmental impacts. They already use them and have been using them for over 25 years to compare themselves, to make uh, proper informed decisions, to see if they change a material or another, or they introduce a technology or not. And they often find a lot of surprises over there. So I, I'd say my cycle thinking is a really good, um, I don't know, like a really good environmental practice if you wanna be really informed about your, your decisions, to make conscious decisions. Thank you. Um, I think that's all of our audience questions for, de- for today. Um, but if our listeners want to learn anything more, more about you, um, where can they find you? Oh, well, um, my webpage of my uh, personal consultancy is called uh, footprintinitiative.org. So mm-hmm. you can find me there. You can find me by LinkedIn also. Um, and yes, I'm always open to questions. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, we'll make sure all of those um, links are in the show notes so people can find you easily. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. I have learned a lot about what life cycle thinking is, and I will start implementing that in my own life, I think. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to On The House, produced by the Household Management Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes like this from across 10 life management perspectives can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, and any other podcasting apps available on your smart devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating, sharing, and subscribing to our channel as it helps other people to find it so we can grow and continue to bring you quality resources. More of our work can be found on our website, hm.lmsl.net, where you can join our movement. I'm Gabriella Yastra. Thanks for tuning in.